Good morning. My name is Jeff Sharp, and I'm the director of the School of Environment and Natural Resources. Thank you for joining us today. I'm broadcasting here in Clintonville, um, and I'm sure many of you are spread across the uh, Columbus metropolitan area and maybe even further beyond. So welcome, and thank you for joining us. As you are logging in, on logging in, please feel free to share in the chat box with all attendees your name and where you are joining us from. We're glad you are here. For those of you who are wondering, this event is set up so that everyone will be kept on mute during the program except for our speakers, and don't worry, your cameras are not on. These are certainly unique times as we gear up for the autumn semester at Ohio State. Perhaps someday we will have an EPN event focused solely on the impact of the many adjustments we are making on campus to our research labs, office buildings, and classrooms to be safe for the arrival of students this month. In the School of Environment and Natural Resources, we are scheduled to teach 75 different courses, of which about uh, 22 of them are going to have a residential component. Primarily, those will be lab-based courses that um, really require physical face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. Uh, we're still trying to figure out some of the logistics how to do that uh, uh, effectively, but I'm very confident that we will. Um, and uh, another 50 of the classes will be conducted uh, um, online entirely. Uh, we're very fortunate in the school to have some great support, and I anticipate those online courses are going to be well uh, offered, and we have a really strong team that's going to deliver those. So um, we're excited for the start of the semester, and we're disappointed that we're not going to have everybody on campus, but uh, it's going to be a great year. For years, by working with our food caterer in Ohio State's Facilities Operation Development Department, we prided ourselves at the EPN Breakfast as official zero-waste programs where we diverted a significant amount of our materials from the landfill through composting and appropriate recycling. Many of you who have joined us uh, at actual um, physical uh, EPN events recall that several students from the school uh, helped with uh, supporting these efforts and uh, we consistently sort of like had people stationed sorting through the, uh, the waste stream as, uh, as you discarded it. Each day it seems like we hear something new about a shift in how activities will be conducted on educational campuses around Ohio. Going into this autumn semester, we are saddened that in-person breakfast events will not be taking place and we will not be able to sort of like sort through the compost like we have in the past. That said, if the past five months have taught us anything, it's that there are still plenty of things we can do to learn, share, and build knowledge in our remote and hybrid work and life settings. The present is also an opportunity to evaluate how our shifting societal behaviors are impacting the environment, perhaps differently than before the coronavirus pandemic. This is all the transition into today's topic. I've been excited about this event for months. As I've been curious about the types and amounts of materials that we throw away in our central Ohio region and how these rates and patterns have been impacted by our changing times. I know with the spring uh, into the summer, many of you like me probably did sort of like more thorough house cleanings and had more solid waste to dispose of. And so just uh, as curiosity, I'm curious sort of like how uh, uh, the waste stream's been diverted um, and even think about Ohio State, we have not had much trash there. So I'm sure this is creating some, uh, some real challenges. And so I'm kind of excited to hear about how things have changed and, and whether there are gonna be some permanent changes in the long term. Minimizing our footprint through waste diversion is critical and it's great to have Kyle O'Keefe joining us today who will share about the many activities Swaco is under ten, undertaking in this arena. You can re review a brief bio for Kyle on the screen in front of you. Prior to joining Swaco, Kyle was the Zero Waste Program Director for Rural Action and was an instructor at Hocking College before that. Currently, he is tasked with helping Franklin County achieve a 75% waste, diver waste diversion rate within 12 years through new programs, policy, and market-driven solutions. Please don't hesitate to ask Kyle questions throughout the program, though please do use the Zoom Q&A box feature in the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. Nicole Jackson and Joe Campbell are monitoring the dialogue there and will be posing these questions live back to Kyle in about 20 to 30 minutes. You will be able to use the chat feature also in your Zoom taskbar during the presentation to make statements and share your thoughts with other attendees. You can also use the chat feature to troubleshoot technological or connection issues directly with our event host, Joe Nicole, in case you have them. And I want to give a big shout out to Joe Campbell and, and Nicole Jackson, who uh, have done a wonderful job of putting this all together and, and are always the ones on top of sort of like these logistical things. So thanks, Joe and Nicole, for everything you're doing here. So again, questions specific to Kyle and his presentation go in the Q&A feature. Thank you for joining us today. And now over to you, Kyle. Great. Thank you, Jeff, Nicole, and Joe. Let me pull up my uh, screen here and we'll get started. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. Really excited to have this conversation with all of you. 
everybody joining virtually um, during these times. Um, as mentioned, I'm Kyle O'Keefe, Director of Innovation and Programs at the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio, otherwise known as Suego. Um, for those who don't know who Suego is, we uh, own and operate the Franklin County Sanitary Landfill. We have two transfer stations, but more importantly, we're largely tasked with helping to reduce reliance on landfilling through proper waste reduction, prevention, reuse, recycling, um, all of these great strategies. Uh, today, we really want to kind of give you an overview of what goes on in Franklin County in our waste stream, answer a number of the questions that Jeff had brought up and some of the more recent impacts too in terms of COVID, COVID as well. Um, but we're really hoping that you'll kind of gain a sense of our waste stream, um, your role in it, and what we can do to help um, better leverage it. Uh, we mentioned COVID. I'll touch on some of the data and some of the impacts during the, the peak of COVID and kind of where that stands now as well. Um, but lastly, I just want to mention before we get started, um, we, you know, are highly collaborative. We love to work with others on projects, initiatives, um, and so keep that in mind as you go through this. We all touch waste in our daily personal lives or and even professional lives, and so think about how these topics may apply to you and collaboration opportunities. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly so we can also get to some Q&A and discussions. But here in Franklin County, um, businesses, residents annually generate over 1 million tons of waste uh, just here, just from our county that we landfill every year. Um, there's a tremendous amount of valuable resources that we're landfilling and we do this. Um, all of the, the energy, the extraction, everything else is being wasted as it goes into the landfill. So huge opportunities here um, as we can move forward. Um, not to mention that, you know, our, our life of our landfill is is finite. Um, we have about over 40 years left currently in the landfill, um, but landfills are also very expensive propositions to continue to maintain, and, and you're basically maintaining those indefinitely as well. So today we'll talk more about some solutions that are being developed and um, how we can advance those. Uh, one of the concepts that this really ties into is the circular economy. This is a, a term that a lot of folks are familiar with these days. Uh, this is a graphic from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, kind of a leading organization in this topic uh, globally. And, you know, here you can really understand that, you know, they're kind of breaking it into biological and technical sort of nutrients, if you will, for a system. And all of this has to be predicated on better design, better design of systems, better design of products, um, and how that kind of circularity can occur. Um, it's important to note that, I mean, really the circular economy is in effect today to some degree. Um, it's happening here in central Ohio, it's happening around the world at various levels. And part of our goal is to really strengthen and build upon these various aspects, which we'll talk about. But even here in central Ohio, um, we've been able to study some of just the economic impacts. And this is a study from about two years ago. Uh, you can find this document um, on our website but really trying to identify what is the economic impact of our recycling industry. And so in the study, we were able to identify over 370 businesses here in Franklin County and surrounding contiguous counties um, that impact uh, our economy. And all these um, businesses either contribute through manufacturing, uh, collection, processing of this material, and as you can see, supporting 5,000 employees, uh, a significant over a billion dollars in revenue, and over 234 million in payroll. So these are the direct impacts. When you look at the indirect impacts this has, it basically amplifies that, it basically doubles it. So, you know, it's a significant part of our economy and we can do more to even grow this. Which brings me a little bit to where Swaco is and who Swaco is. As I mentioned, we are the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio. We are a public entity. Um, we actually have a nine member board uh, and we were created by statute. Uh, part of our goal here is to plan for safe disposal, but again, reducing reliance on landfills is a major part of that. Um, as Jeff indicated, we have a 75% diversion goal by the year 2032. We're currently around a 50% diversion um, for the entire district today. And when we talk about that, we're looking at all materials, right? So even here you see electronics or tires or yard waste, all of that material is aggregated into those goals and into those numbers as well. And so, you know, as Waco, we're, we're really here to, to be a catalyst to try and advance these topics and these issues, provide programs, resources, technical expertise, 
Um, and we can't do this alone. Again, this is a very collaborative effort. Everybody has to play a role in making this possible. So working with local government entities, working with institutions, OSU, we work with a number of professors um, on different uh, research projects as well. So um, a lot of things we can do together. Uh, some of the ways that we look at waste diversion really fall into these kind of pillars, as we call them. Um, and it ranges from just making sure that folks have the basic education and awareness, knowing how to participate in systems, why to participate in systems is key to our culture, um, and making sure that we're able to do this successfully. Uh, we also need to have infrastructure. Infrastructure plays a really critical role in providing access to services, right? We can't participate in recycling if we don't have access to recycling services. And in order to have that access, we also need markets. We need to have uh, markets for these materials, markets for these services. There has to be demand kind of pulling that um, as well. And then last but certainly not least, we also have to have informed policy. And these things work um, really throughout each other uh, on these different topics, but they have to be integrated and working together. Um, and when it comes to policy, um, even, you know, Swaco has some policy levers, but we are fairly limited too. a lot of these policies reside even at the local municipality level or even at the federal level as well. So we're kind of have to work with partners and, and implementing and improving these policies. So let's talk a little bit more about where this trash comes from, right? And these next few slides will just be kind of focused on that. And I think Jeff even touched on this. Where, where is all this trash coming from? What does that mean? What is it made of? So when we look at this, uh, where is it coming from sort of aspect, we kind of break it into two categories. One we'll call commercial, which is basically everything that's away from home. Um, it, there's a caveat to that, which I'll mention in a second. And the other is residential, um, which is really single family households, really units up to about, um, you know, smaller apartments up to about four units are included in this. But once you get to larger apartment complexes, a lot of that data and information ends up in this commercial sector in that sense as large apartment complexes are treated as commercial businesses. So there is that caveat, but this just gives you a little bit of anecdotal understanding about where is this material being generated from? Where is it coming from? I also wanted to provide you with a little bit of just historical context here in terms of um, the amount of material being landfilled um, accompanied by looking at our population. And in this graph, you can kind of tell that um, the, the blue line here is our population over time over the past 13 years or so. And the orange line is the total amount of material that's currently being uh, landfilled. Uh, the gray bars are really uh, looking at this from a per capita standpoint with the population and the amount that we're landfilling. Um, so what you can see here too is, you know, the amount that's being landfilled has gradually declined um, over time. And, you know, even today we are seeing it continue to inch up on a per capita level. Um, some of that corresponds with population growth. Part of that also corresponds with, this, with the strength of the economy in large part. You notice I put a little red arrow here uh, for 2009. You know, really what this is indicating, as we've all seen, I just mentioned the economy, right? Where the depression, the impacts of the depression really, you know, caused a severe dip in the amount of waste that was being generated. Um, and we saw a lot of this also translate into the future. But this is also compounded by the fact that there are new recycling programs being established around these times that have also reduced the amount of material being landfilled. But overall, what, what this kind of also has indicated, especially during these times, is that our, our materials continue to change, they continue to evolve. Um, we call this the evolving ton. Um, and this is a nice little graphic that was put together by a firm called Resource Recycling Systems, um, really helping to describe and show the change in material types um, over the past decade, 10, 15 years. Um, and as you can see, you know, we have been decreasing in things like newspaper, right? A lot of the digitization of information these days and the reduction of newspaper as a great example, but also a lot of these heavier materials that have been more traditional in the waste stream historically. And, and as we went through a lot of these changing times, you know, manufacturers were also forced to think more about their, their products and their packaging um, and how to make them more efficient, you know, how to make them lighter. And as you can tell, when you look at this right-hand side, you can see that really the growth here is in plastics and we've seen a lot more plastic production of packaging alone from different bottles in large part in certain containers. We also see tremendous growth in corrugated containers and I'm sure we can all 
assume what that's from. E-commerce is, is huge today. Uh, we also even call this the Amazon effect um, in the industry these days. So that continues to grow and evolve, obviously, and something that we're all um, monitoring very closely and uh, trying to work with those, um, those entities as well. And then we can take an even deeper look into Franklin County's landfill um, waste characterization. This is a study that we conducted really over the course of 2018 and 2019. And it helped us to really get very granular in terms of what is coming into the landfill, where is it coming from? And this graph really helps to just um, depict the overall outcomes of that study. And what we can see here is that roughly you know, 76% of the material that's going into the landfill today has the potential to be diverted, um, recycled, reused, uh, composted. And so a lot of potential here when we look at this. And so we can even break this down. One of the um, leading or the top material in here is food waste at about 15%. Uh, and that's, you know, um, pretty consistent. Even when you look at waste characterization studies across the state, the numbers are roughly around that for food waste. So, and this is really a result of there's not the infrastructure, there's not the programs and the services that are in place today to really sufficiently address that as an issue. So you'll hear more about that and what we're doing to address that in a moment. We also have recyclable material and these are largely what you would consider your traditional recyclables, the things that you recycle at home. And there's huge opportunity here. These are things that we can be doing today. There's access, there's services available, and we can really be improving a lot of the capture of this material. And then we get into these other um, recovery opportunities. And oftentimes these are more difficult to recover materials. They, they may require more participation from the consumer to take it from point A to point B to be dropped off. And so convenience is a factor, but you know, markets and infrastructure also play a significant role here as well. And so we'll talk a little bit more about these. Um, and then certainly not everything can be recovered. So, you know, roughly 24% of the materials being landfilled, you know, doesn't really have a market or a capability to be recovered today. Um, and those are opportunities too that we'll continue to see um, evolving changes as well. And so I want to kind of dive into some of these topics in a little bit more detail. Uh, just a moment ago, I mentioned the kind of recycling portion of that, and I wanted to use this residential recycling as really something that I think we're all familiar with. Use it as an example here to identify some problems and some opportunities for improvement. Um, one of the, you know, a couple of statistics here, you know, over 98% of single family households in Franklin County have access to curbside recycling. And this means that, you know, if you live in a community, um, you typically have a service that's coming to your door weekly or bi-weekly to collect those recyclables. Yet, when we look at the material that's being captured and what's currently going to the landfill, we're only capturing about 40% of those recyclables that are being generated. That means about 60% of those recyclables that are accepted in those programs are still going to the landfill. So a huge opportunity there in terms of what we can do to be improving. You know, on top of that, you know, we've done a poll and different polls in the past and um, a couple of years ago, the question that people responded to was, you know, do you feel confident? Do you know what can be recycled? And almost 50% of those respondents stated that they are confused by what can be recycled. So you're being able to see, you know, some correlations here. As a result of this, we really launched an educational recycling campaign. It's called Recycle Right, Make a Difference. Um, this has been out for over a year now, and we're going through another phase here to kind of revamp this campaign right now. But it's really accompanied by a number of things. Um, first, I'll just mention our RecycleRight.org website. This is a great resource. This is something that everybody should take a look at. Excuse me. And really just kind of get familiar with what's recyclable, what's not, what are the issues when it comes to recycling, especially in the household. Um, this campaign has also been used in a couple different ways. Uh, we also have a community toolkit and a toolkit that even businesses can use um, largely to implement various elements of this campaign in their community. And so these are often accompanied by flyers, educational mailers, even a magnet which you can see on this slide that really just helps people understand here's what to recycle, here are really some things that should be avoided um, in terms of uh, recycling. And there's also an advertisement campaign that accompanies this as well. Over the past two years, we've distributed uh, these materials to almost over 100,000 households in Franklin County, 
Um, and we're continuing to expand that so all households will receive these materials over the next couple of years here. Um, digging a little bit deeper here, the, the recycling and reuse search tool that accompanies the Recycle Right Make a Difference campaign. So even if it's not your traditional recyclables and you're saying, oh, I've got this, um, you know, compact fluorescent light bulb or uh, batteries, um, a whole variety of materials. We actually have over 35 materials listed on this website that you can click on, find what to do, how to manage that material and where to take it. There's a map feature where you can find what's the nearest location to where I am and where can I take this type of material. So hopefully that will answer a lot of questions, really encourage you to take a look at this um, and see what you have. We also are looking for feedback. So if you know of new locations out there or other materials that like you would like to see added, um, just send us an email. There's a, a chat function even in that um, Recycle Right Make a Difference website. And so one of the topics that we often discuss when we're talking about recycling is the topic of contamination. Uh, what is contamination? Contamination is really material that um, oftentimes people think are recyclable, um, but are not, or, or maybe just some negligence in putting things that they know are not recyclable into the recycling can. And this creates a number of issues. This really kind of hinders the ability of the processor to take that material, process it efficiently and cost effectively. Um, our main processor here who recycles this material is Rumpke. And you know, in doing that, they um, have to deal with thousands of tons of recyclables. And when they get things like tanglers is one of the issues that we highlight here, um, but that can tangle up in their equipment, stop production, and cause some significant issues. So last year we launched this recycling cart tag initiative for the first time. This was done in conjunction with Ohio EPA, uh, the city of Columbus, um, Rumpke, and others. And the goal of this was really to kind of take, do a brief inspection of about 18,000 households and their recycling carts. And some of the things that we found in doing that was about one in four households that we inspected uh, required a tag or had some level of contamination. And these tags look like the example on the left here, these oops tags. And it also talks about you know, how to recycle right as well. And so the top issues we saw here were plastic bags and recyclables being put into bags, um, which is also a common misconception when it comes to recycling. Uh, these tags were kind of corrected. They're educational in nature, but if they got repeat offenses, their cart would even be rejected. Um, and so what we saw as a result was some significant improvements, um, you know, a 60% uh, reduction in bag recyclables or 30% reduction in plastic bags, 26% um, de decline overall in the tagging that was taking place. So we saw positive ramifications, a much cleaner stream as a result of this. And this is something we plan to expand to other communities here over the next couple of years. Uh, also related to residential recycling, we launched our Community Recycling Cart Initiative. Um, the goal of this initiative is really to help communities graduate from your smaller 18 gallon bins to your larger 65 gallons or even 95 gallon recycling containers. Um, in this initiative, work, Swaco is providing about 50% of the cost for these recycling carts. Um, we've also been able to leverage uh, national funding. so. We've actually been able to reduce those costs for communities um, all the way down to 20, 30% of the cost. So this has been a, a, a hugely successful initiative over the past year where we distributed over 38,000 recycling carts to five communities. And our goal is to grow that, really to have every community have a recycling cart in Franklin County. Um, we also kind of studied the impacts of this. So what, what kind of impacts did that have? And just one of the, the salient points I'll mention was we captured an additional 15% of just the recyclables that were being generated. So remember how we were talking about that 40% number? Well, now we've been able to increase that um, and we continue to grow that just upon initial findings of, of this project. So now I'm gonna to skip to another subject of food waste and I'm really gonna call this out because I mentioned it earlier, you know, food waste is the, the largest single category material coming into our landfill by weight at about 15%. Um, and part of this is there's just, a, it's a difficult um, material to manage. It's not an aluminum can. It doesn't carry an inherent value. So having to develop markets and infrastructure is really kind of where we are. And this is really reflective of, you know, around the state of Ohio, even around the country for that matter. 
Um, in 2019, we launched the Central Ohio Food Waste Initiative. This was largely a collaborative effort with about 150 different organizations here in Franklin County to really look at the topic of food waste and say, how can we work together? We know we all have to work together to solve this. Uh, the result of that was the Food Waste Action Plan, which created about 20 different solution areas and topics, um, all to cut food waste in half by 2030. And this is also a national and even global goal, um, ultimately. And we looked at doing this holistically, right? We looked at doing it through types of prevention methods, even rescuing edible food and feeding hungry people, to recycling food through composting, feeding animals, and even industrial uses. So um, really this plan encapsulates a lot of this. Really encourage you to take a look at it. You can find it on our website. And I'll be talking about some of the activities here that um, have resulted as well. And so really when we talk about these 20 solutions, we have a number of projects underway. I won't speak in great detail about all of these, but um, really coming up here this next a uh, month or so, we will be launching a new awareness campaign called Save More Than Food, Make a Difference. The goal of this campaign is really to empower uh, residents, businesses, schools on how to reduce food waste. You know, what types of resources are out there? What kind of educational tools? So it will be very comprehensive um, and applicable to basically everyone. Um, this campaign also encapsulates a lot of these activities you see on here, right, ranging from working with schools, got a number of different school resources out there today. These are things that you can even use in your households with kids if you'd like to, um, but also food rescue. This is a major component of feeding people and not throwing away good food. Um, so there's a lot of great work being done in Central Ohio today from our, our regional Middle Ohio Food Collective to um, voluntary food rescue um, organizations as well. And I'll also touch upon some of these, but really the only other one I wanted to mention right now was this organics management planning. This is really looking at the topic of all the things that can be composted. What can we be doing here in Central Ohio to grow and scale our infrastructure for composting food waste? Um, currently, this is very limited today. Um, it, it kind of really prohibits um, communities from doing more composting. So we wanna say, what's the solution to that? How can we co-invest into some of these options? So I'm going through this fairly quickly for the sake of time, but um, also really wanted to touch on that Swaco has over a dozen programs. I'm really not gonna get into a lot of detail with today, but really encourage you to go to swaco.org to check out. Um, this ranges from working with businesses. In fact, we'll be launching new business recycling resources here this fall. I encourage you to um, take a look, be on the look for that. Um, to working with events, we heard uh, some of the work that's being done at the um, the network events here. Uh, so, you know, this applies to all events in Central Ohio. We even have grants. Um, we also have outreach programs and landfill tours. If you're an organization that wants to come down for a landfill tour, let us know. Of course, a number of these things have been impacted by COVID, even from a programming standpoint, right? We haven't been offering landfill tours today, but we really hope to be able to do that, hopefully in the near future, um, if not next year. And then we have just, again, a, quite a range of community resources here, ranging from working with our communities, helping them plan and implement collection programs, to addressing environmental crimes, right? Dumping is an issue everywhere um, or, or in the community around the world. And so we are able to work with our sheriffs and our prosecutors to reinforce these kinds of issues and keep our community clean. Um, we all probably have household hazardous waste. We have programs for that. Um, and if you need additional recycling capacity to take material and drop it off, we have drop-off recycling locations throughout Franklin County. So just touching on some of these things here, but really encourage you to take a look at swaco.org to learn more. I also wanted to make a pitch for our community waste reduction grant. Uh, this is a grant we've had in place now for about five years, and it's really meant to be creative solutions to waste problems. Um, We've supported uh, dozens of projects through this over the years, ranging from reuse, like the, the furniture bank, to education in schools, to basic things like recycling containers and facilities. Or the other picture here is of a food waste drop-off program, which we've been growing that throughout Franklin County as a viable option for right now. And even research projects. Uh, if there's, you wanna understand what's in your waste stream, you wanna do analysis of that to build a program, this can be a great um, grant opportunity for you. Uh, these grants are currently, uh, the deadline is August 25th, 
we may be extending that for a week or two. So I encourage you to just kind of take a look at the, at the grant and see if that's appropriate for you. This is a, uh, open to nonprofit entities, government entities, and would be projects for the calendar year of 2021. Um, the grant funds support up to 75% of the project costs. And so again, check out our website, download the application. Um, these are very collaborative in nature. So we love to work with you on the projects. Um, again, really encourage you to uh, take a look at this. Uh, Spaco also believes in economic development, really in terms of, you know, the waste stream is uh, market driven and we need to continue to grow and expand those markets. Um, we most recently have formed a partnership with Rev1 Ventures. Uh, the goal of this partnership is really to spur on innovation. Uh, Rev1, if for those who are not familiar, are really the, the leading technology startup uh, firm here in Central Ohio. Um, and by working with them, we're really able to leverage entrepreneurship um, and identify opportunities to work regionally on these topics. So we'll be starting with the topic of food waste, as you heard me speak about earlier, and saying how can we as a region you know, help support entrepreneurship, help to develop innovative solutions that are scalable in our community and really get this started. So you'll be hearing more about that this fall. And then we'll be branching out to go beyond food waste and really address all aspects of the waste stream and how we can be sort of cutting edge when we're talking about innovation and technology solutions for reducing and impacting waste. So really excited about that project. I uh, encourage you to learn more as that comes available. Um, you may have heard recently that we are launching a solar energy project on our closed landfill. We also refer to this landfill as model landfill. But you can see a picture of it here really at the intersection of 71 South and 270. Um, this is also the former Phoenix uh, golf course. Um, so we own this uh, closed landfill and this landfill has reoccurring maintenance costs. In fact, there was a fund that would help to, to pay for this and we have really depleted those, those funds. So we have to find ways to generate revenue from this as well. And in doing that, we've been able to put out bids and solicit working with a contractor called BQ Energy. Um, so they're really in their first couple of phases of due diligence here, but the goal is to turn this uh, landfill into a solar array project um, this would be probably one of the largest solar array projects on a closed landfill in the country. Um, and our hope is really to leverage a lot of this energy to use it within our communities to benefit our communities. So we're having those conversations right now and really excited about what this uh, project could bring for Central Ohio. Uh, next, I just wanna talk a little bit more about kind of the impacts of you know, COVID and the amounts of material that we're currently landfilling. Um, this is just a chart uh, that kind of uh, depicts the kind of waste that was coming to our landfill per month over the past six months and reflective of 2019 as well. And really the, the key months here to be, be looking at are, are April and May in which we saw a decrease in the amount of being landfilled respectively about 12% um, in April and about 16% you know, in May overall. That was really the peak of what we have seen so far in terms of diversion. Then you can see this really rebounded in June and July um, with more commercial businesses coming back online. Um, so really helping us to say, okay, yeah, there was an impact. In fact, we didn't, we probably reduced a lot of waste um, as a result of this during those months. Uh, really when we take a granular look at this, when we say, okay, during that peak time, what was going on? Uh, what we have heard from our waste haulers was that, you know, the commercial waste decreased approximately 30%. So a lot of those dumpsters weren't getting filled up. Um, a lot of that material is being displaced. Jeff kind of mentioned, hey, I've been at home, um, you know, as we all have, and, you know, probably cleaning out the house, probably, you know, doing even more recycling, more waste generation as a result. So we did see increases of 20% or even higher in terms of the amount of material that's being generated at the residential level. So you see a displacement here quite a bit. Um, and that also means that, I mean, a lot of other things, people are, you know, we had a lot of flooding, people are throwing out bulky materials too, but again, there's a lot of impetus here for even recycling more materials properly at home. I also just wanted to share a couple of slides here on the impacts of commodities and supply chain. Um, you know, these materials and even the reduction in commercial volumes have impacted uh, the recycling commodities and supply chains as well. And I won't get you know, into this too much, but one of the questions that I think a lot of people have asked in the past uh, when it comes to recycling is the impacts of China and the green sword. Um, and this is really where China was consuming a lot of materials 
from the U.S. and has since kind of stopped um, that from a policy standpoint. Um, and what that has done is affected our markets, you know, throughout the, the country. Um, I will say, though, that uh, Franklin County, all of Ohio has been very fortunate where we have had very strong, very robust recycling industry, as I kind of indicated with our recycling impact study. And so a lot of the material, you know, you might even say the majority of the recyclables that are generated at your household level are even staying within the state of Ohio or surrounding states. So we're very fortunate in terms of that. However, you know, the markets um, for these materials, now that there's so much material, were significantly impacted. And a lot of that value was lost in material, even though these materials are staying here and being used to benefit Central Ohio and the region. But what we saw during the times of COVID, as you can see in these graphs, was really, you know, when this started to hit, you know, a lot of that cardboard wasn't being generated by the commercial sector, as we talked about a moment ago. And so the value, the, the lack of that material, the demand for it, um, was also high, and that really helped even boost some of this pricing for a period of time, right? There's more e-commerce going on right now, more boxes need to be generated. And so we saw some benefits from that. Now, these are kind of slowly tapering off again as businesses come back online and as that material begins to level off. Um, another topic and a story that we helped to promote during this time was around mixed paper. A lot of mixed paper gets turned into, guess what, tissue paper. Um, and as we heard, there was a tissue paper crisis during uh, COVID as well. So really a high demand for that material. And we have seen, you know, roughly from almost a zero dollar value, which is a, in, an even negative value in some cases over the past uh, year or two, uh, historic low to helping to even boost some of these commodities as well. Now, this story isn't the same for all commodities. Um, some materials themselves, uh, certain plastics, other things have not seen the same bump. And some of that, you know, could be assumed in terms of production levels may be down because of COVID for some uh, types of products and materials. So you're seeing just a whole new storm of, of issues and challenges when it comes to recycling, but there can be some silver linings as well. So one of the, the questions that we are kind of posing is, you know, what can we learn from COVID? Really, this is a chance to strengthen um, our systems to learn about weakness, weak points, weaknesses, and you know, what we can do to help build and collaborate on addressing those, ranging from residential collection to boosting and supporting markets. Um, so I think this is really gonna be a great learning opportunity for our region and seeing where we can go into the future. Uh, lastly, I did wanna just give a little pitch for, you know, think about how you can collaborate with us, think about the data that we presented today. Um, again, we work on research projects. You might just have a waste stream in your business that you wanna address. Um, we have a grant program where you can apply for grants. We'd love to promote the things that you're doing in the waste stream or even share data that we have. Uh, and we have ongoing ways to stay engaged. We have a newsletter you can sign up for. We have a webinar series going on right now monthly called From Waste to Resources um, or even our social media. So don't hesitate to reach out um, about anything. Uh, here is my contact information. I know I went through this very quickly, as quickly as I could but now we have a chance for some questions and dialogue. So thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Kyle. There was a lot there. I have pages of notes here in front of me um, and some really great questions have come through from the audience. I'm just gonna start off with the first one from Bob Stoll with the Logan County Land Trust, who is asking about, um, and for those who are, who are tuning in, all of our attendees, you can look at the question and answer section to see all the questions that have been uh, posed to Kyle so far. So he asks, um, am I right that Michigan continues to have a deposit program on aluminum cans and possibly other items? Can you speak on the success of this program? Um, yes, Michigan does have a deposit program. I'm really probably not equipped to fully speak on the program and, and how it's performing. Um, there are deposit programs around the country um, and you know there are Oh, I don't know if I can call it a debate, but there are different points of views in terms of how impactful this program has been. Um, you might also recall if you've been following some of the recycling news that Michigan has reported some of the lower recycling rates um, for states. And so they, you know, they are have a huge initiative going on right now to try and boost those recycling rates. So, um, you know, I think I can't really fully answer the question, but I think um, you know, there definitely have been some beneficial impacts. How beneficial those impacts have been, I think have, all, have been called into question um, at various levels uh, from an industry. Okay. 
Yeah, some really good questions coming in. Um, so I'm gonna start the next one uh, from uh, Brian, and this has to do with uh, what you were uh, referencing earlier about contaminating um, recyclables. Uh, perhaps um, Kyle could talk more about the recycling contamination um, and why that is bad. Otherwise, uh, people recycle, recycle everything, uh, which causes problems for recycle vendors and markets. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great question. Um, and I, I just briefly touched on it earlier, but um, contamination can have a number of different issues, right? Uh, I mentioned it can you know, affect the equipment in a materials recovery facility where these materials are being processed, um, causing damage or increased costs. Um, when you're putting trash in the recycling container, now we're having to touch that material multiple times. That's creating additional expenses. Um, as well as, you know, just trash ending up in recyclables devalues those recyclables. So it actually devalues um, the price that they're able to sell that material for and hurts the overall system for recycling. So there are a number of issues when that occurs. Um, they're all serious. If we have uh, bad uh, contamination rates, which we've been fortunate we have not necessarily, uh, as opposed to some other regions um, of the state that have had you know, 30% or even 40% contamination rates, you know, from our understanding and working with Rumpke, you know, these have been, depending on the year and the season, you know, maybe between as low as 10%, maybe as high as 20%, depending on uh, where that material is coming from. So still manageable, a lot of good work that still needs to be done, but uh, this is something that we can all, you know, really learn more about and improve our behaviors and, you know, how we individually have an impact on recycling. So. This is, this is a really, it can't be understated, the importance of reducing contamination in the recycling stream. And please check out uh, recycleright.org to learn more about what contamination is and how to recycle right. Thanks, Kyle, for that answer. Next question is from Kimberly Winslow. Um, even though metals are a small component of the waste stream recycle materials, um, she's always wondered about uh, bars downtown near campus uh, any way to improve recycling in these areas? Uh, anything can be anything that can be done to support the idea. Um, seeing that trash, sorry, seeing that uh, trash cans are filled with beer cans and bottles um, seems like that's a missed opportunity. Yeah, there have been some initiatives in the past um, to even capture glass uh, bottles. Uh, the city of Columbus has worked on this topic, um, had, has instituted a program um, that still exists today to help capture more of that material. Um, I know this is a topic that we want to help work with the city on as well. Uh, you mentioned aluminum cans, and, and this is true for residential households too. It's almost been a phenomenon in, in terms of the industry where, you know, there have been low capture numbers of, for aluminum cans. So what I mean by that is that we're capturing, you know, less than 50% and sometimes even, you know, into the 30% of aluminum cans. Uh, that are being generated and you have to ask yourself why uh, you know because this is a material that can almost be infinitely recycled and uh, is highly valuable and um, requires a lot of energy to extract so you know even just education on these basic materials um, we've seen improvement i mentioned these studies we did on the carts and where we saw before we implemented a cart with education uh, it was around a 30 or 40 percent and after we saw it, it jump to nearly 60 percent in terms of the aluminum can capture so uh, we, we can see some benefits there. Um, and speaking about bars, I mean, yes, this is a whole thing where contamination also plays a factor when we're talking about bars, but um, we are very fortunate to have glass recycling here in Ohio. Um, many states have even dropped glass because it is an expense, but uh, we've been fortunate to have a lot of glass industry here in the region, creating fiberglass, creating bottles. So um, a lot of glass is being captured today, and there are certainly things that we can do more to capture that material. Okay, next question is from David. How can residents influence their township or municipality to improve recycling efforts when they are negotiating contracts with waste haulers? Great question. Um, so Swaco offers a program, a technical assistance program just designed for communities. We call it our community consortium program, but really we work with any community that wants to work with us. There's probably about um, over 30 communities out of the 41 communities here in Franklin County um, that we work with. And we actually help them to design those bids, help them to incorporate best practices. Uh, and that includes things like education, making sure that the haulers are distributing education. You know, if they see contamination in 
those recycling carts, that they're doing things proper, do, properly doing things to educate those residents or not collect that material because it may be uh, detrimental to recycling. Um, and then we put in other things too, where right now we're even helping communities to explore volume-based uh, waste. Uh, so it's basically a pay as you throw system where the more waste that you generate, the more you pay, the less waste that you generate, the less you pay. Um, and really accompanied this by robust recycling programs, yard waste programs as well. So we'd be happy to work with any municipality. Um, if you have questions and you're outside of Franklin County, we'd still be happy to have a conversation with you and direct you to resources that you may be able to benefit from. Next question is from uh, Patricia, and you mentioned this earlier about uh, China and um, them processing uh, waste. Uh, is there a market for these uh, recyclables, even though uh, there's no longer um, that happening uh, on China's end? Um, I think I understand the question, um, but I guess that ultimately a lot of the materials that you see that are recyclable here in Franklin County. Again, if you go to that Recycle Right website, you'll be able to see what you can put in your bin at home. Um, those materials all have homes. They all, they all have markets here in the region um, and around the country, and they're fairly stable markets. Um, you know, some of the challenges have been around mixed plastics in the past, where there's a lot of other plastics in the waste stream that just don't have markets today. And what I mean by that is that they, you know, there may be types of plastics that just don't have a demand, may require more sorting or processing. And so a lot of that material was what was getting shipped to China. And I think you can even find documentaries on the plastic, the impacts of plastic sorting in China. Um, and so a lot of that has really caused some of the challenges nationally. You know, we haven't been trying to accept those materials here locally because there aren't markets. And when I say we, I'm really referring to Rumpke and, and how we're working with our communities but we hope to even attract more industries that can use that material and therefore expanding opportunities to collect more types of material in the future, including these types of plastics. All right, this uh, next question is from Luann Hendricks. Uh, do you have any numbers on the amount of pet, uh, pet waste that's going into the landfill? Um, that's a good question. Um, we may have um, some anecdotal information on that. I'd have to look that up, but I could probably get back to you. Um, but I think it's probably, you know, around 1%, uh, maybe 2% or, uh, or less than that. Um, Uh, this is a comment from Patty. Uh, please consider smaller recycling containers um, for carts uh, for single person households and for anyone who can't manage uh, the big containers. Yeah, that's a great comment. Uh, not as much of a question, but yes, uh, we will consider that. And I think it goes back to this volume based type approach, which we're hoping to implement more throughout Franklin County. That gives residents a choice of uh, cart size. And so if you're generating less trash, you can have a smaller container um, and that might be easier to manage and you know people uh, have concerns about storage of these containers as well um, so we will definitely take that into consideration um, i'm going to skip down a little bit uh, and you mentioned this in your presentation um, as far as covid um, uh, this is from des uh, i apologize if i missed this uh, but do we know if food waste is coming primarily from residential or commercial sources, uh, does composting at the household level have much of an impact? Uh, great question. Um, yeah, I mean, food waste, when we look at the numbers, uh, you know, percentage wise, that was roughly, uh, roughly the same, um, around a 15% for both residential and commercial. Now you have to take the commercial kind of with a grain of salt, knowing that there are so many different types of commercial businesses out there and we're, when we're doing sampling, we are really using a methodology uh, that samples randomly. Um, so certainly from a restaurant might be different than an office. Uh, but what we did see was that, you know, they were based off that random sampling re relatively close. Um, now we know that a lot of food waste is generated in the household. Um, I think I was looking at some of these numbers the other day and roughly, you know, 185 pounds um, per household is the amount of food waste that is being generated annually. Um, and so that, that's a lot. Uh, and, you know, certainly taking efforts in the home to reduce food waste can have huge impacts. 
Uh, and a lot of that's just around prevention, right? I mean, how do we not generate as much? How can we plan better when we go to the store? How can we preserve our food better or store it better? Um, and then you mentioned composting too, and uh, certainly backyard composting can have an impact. Uh, we have a, a program with Franklin uh, County Soil and Water Conservation District to um, actually have a rebate. So if you're looking to implement a, a backyard composting program, we help to offset some of those costs. And there's also a training, making sure you know how to compost properly so you're not causing issues, odors, or attracting rodents. But I will just also mention, I mean, composting, I've done some composting projects where, you know, even myself, you can almost do all of your food waste through a backyard composting program if you do it properly. So yes, it can have significant impacts. Okay, so this question came in in the, um, the chat um, from Kate. Uh, can you speak to the curbside compost pickup feasibility study? Uh, what are the primary barriers to this program here in Central Ohio compared to the cities with successful programs, for example, Oakland, California? Yeah, good question. I'll try and be brief, but um, we have not done ourselves a feasibility on the curbside study, just to be clear. Um, we, we have been doing a feasibility study on kind of the larger regional systems for composting. Um, the city of Bexley has a curbside program that residents can opt into. And, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty much the only curbside program today. Part of the challenges right now, as I mentioned, is around this infrastructure and really to um, reduce costs overall and shorten logistics. Um, the cost is still a barrier. And, you know, when you look at communities like Oakland or um, other communities even on the West Coast, you know, one of the examples that they're using is they're actually able to combine their food waste with their yard waste collection programs where that material is able to be composted and really a service that can be offered by a range of different collect collection options. Um, we don't have those capabilities here today. That's part of what the study that we're looking at is really addressing. You know, what, what does that infrastructure look like? You know, how can that support these other types of programs? Because costs and logistics and infrastructure are really the main barriers today to expanding those types of programs. Um, now we believe that, you know, we can solve some of those issues by working together, and that will be part of the key to achieving this 75% diversion goal. So that's definitely a main point of focus, even right now, on, on some of the things that we're working on. Thank you. All right, so the next question is from Matt Walbridge. Um, have childhood education programs impacted overall recycling rates over uh, the long term? Um, I do remember reading about um, a program happening here in Columbus with Sustainable Grandview and uh, their partnership with uh, kids that compost. So um, working with different neighborhoods to collect food waste, um, providing containers to collect food waste. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think this is a, a great question to speak more to the youth component of uh, these programs. Yeah, absolutely. And we have to be working with our youth and educating our next generation on these topics. I mean, you know, so oftentimes, you know, you think back upon your school years and, you know, part of the messaging that you received, you probably impact you some way. And we even hear that today from kids who took landfill tours, you know, a decade ago and how they talk about how that has impacted them. We have, you know, over 4,000 school kids typically come on, on landfill tours um, annually and that number continues to grow. Um, we also have all sorts of resources for schools these days, but again, there's some obstacles right now in working with schools. We don't have, you know, I would say tremendously quantifiable results in terms of what impact does that have and how does that translate to the household. Um, that, that's a little bit difficult to measure, but I, I can speak personally that, um, you know, talking with parents, uh, colleagues, others is, you know, they talk about it all the time. Hey, my kid went on a landfill tour or my kid got this type of educational program in the school and they came back and told me how to recycle right. You know, we hear that all the time. And so we know it does have an impact, um, you know, how much and how to quantify that. Don't really have those numbers today, but I can say for certain it does have an impact. And then Kids That Compost and the City of Grandview, I know they're working on a project right now um, to expand that and I think that's wonderful. Um, probably slightly different in nature to some of the traditional school programming that we offer, but um, I know they're, they're getting really creative there as well. 
All right, we have time for one more question. I'm just gonna kind of skip through here. Uh, this is from Kat uh, Zellick. Uh, what developing localized, or sorry, when developing localized uh, slash community specific waste reduction programs, can you describe some of the steps you take to in, uh, engage local communities in the planning process? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's critical. I mean, a lot of our work revolves around working with our local communities. Um, we want them to own these programs. We want them to understand them. You know, we help them to kind of tailor to where they are. Uh, where are you in your process? What do you see as needs in your community? And really, really helping them think through that. Think through that. So our our recycle right education campaign, you know, we customize that with them. We help them update their website. We give them toolkits for social media. Um, we help them create newsletters that they can send to their residents. Um, all sorts of things. Even give presentations in their community to their residents. So we try to make it comprehensive, and we want them to be the experts. You know, our goal is to help them feel ownership over their program and know that they can answer a lot of the basic questions should they get them. So um, we see that confidence growing. We see that consistency growing throughout the region um, compared to a couple of years ago. So a lot of positive improvements there. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, if your question was not answered, please feel free to reach out to Kyle. Um, his information is provided in the chat and we'll be sharing that again after the program. Thank you so much for your questions, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Hand over to Joe. Thank you, Kyle, for the, for the wonderful presentation. Um, Nicole, for helping to get those questions out and everyone who, who chimed in. I think we had over 30 different questions come through, only got to about a third of them. So as Nicole mentioned, We'll follow up with uh, Kyle's information and I'll kick it over to, to Jeff Sharp to conclude us for today. Thank you very much, Kyle, for that great presentation. It's great to see such active engagement on this topic. Um, uh, we've been doing these EPNs for a long time and I think 30 questions is probably a record for any sort of forum we've done. So obviously a, a topic that sparked a lot of interest and Kyle, you did a wonderful job of um, providing us a very informative program. Uh, I personally come away from these kind of programs sort of thinking, what can I do more? And uh, um, I have a few ideas there, but uh, um, it challenges me to sort of like double down on some of my efforts to sort of like um, uh, separate out some of the things that I think I can sort of take to the special pickup and drop off places. So that's going to be my takeaway today. As is our tradi EPN tradition, we want to recognize you with a certificate of appreciation and thanks for your participation today, albeit in an electronic form. Um, Joe is now showing that uh, uh, certificate. Um, you, along with many environmental professionals who participate today, are helping us learn for life and to positively shape our world. Uh, you've given us much to think about, and we will seek to join in reducing our, con our contributions to the waste stream and help more thoughtfully build a vibrant and resilient circular economy for current and future generations in our central Ohio region. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes today's program. Please note that the EPN will be back on Tuesday, September 15th, with a virtual event that will build on some positive momentum in the field of wildlife conservation. Some of you participated in our November 2019 program that addressed bipartisan coalitional strategies to conserve wildlife, facilitated by the National Wildlife Federation and Chief Kendra Wecker of the Ohio Division of Wildlife. Well, earlier this month, the Great American Outdoors Act was finally signed into law, a bill that would fully fund and permanently fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund and restore our national parks as one major way of protecting wildlife. With national park visitor numbers increasing, the infrastructure of some sites could not keep up without needing significant repairs. Meanwhile, there has also been a looming issue regarding lack of diversity among people of color visiting national parks. Our country's demographics are shifting and it's been projected that by 2050 or possibly sooner, the United States will be a minority majority culture. Our next EPN virtual event will ask, what does the Great American Outdoors Act mean long-term? Who all will be part of the repair efforts and what does this mean for the future of our national parks? Join us as we explore how we can best continue to support and advocate for the preservation of our national parks, as well as discussing opportunities to create a more inclusive and accessible national park system. Stay tuned for registration details, which will be available soon at epn.osu.edu. If you have any questions in the meantime, don't hesitate to reach out to Joe and Nicole. Thank you again for all who joined us today and please stay safe and well connected. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.